Welcome to Tales of Britain and Ireland. This is a podcast telling the stories, legends and folk tales of Britain and Ireland in no particular order. Presented by Graham and coming direct from South Yorkshire, each episode tells a story or selection of stories from all across these islands and throughout their history, followed by a short and decidedly inexpert discussion of the origin and themes of each tale. Today we're doing something a little different. Because not all bits of folklore are long enough to make a full story, but are still interesting, this time, rather than one tale, we've got three shorter ones with a linking factor. Hopefully it'll work out, but if it turns out to be dreadful, we'll simply never speak of it again. Leyland is a small town in Lancashire. It's old, very old, with mentions going back to that great and hallowed source for all historians of England, the Doomsday Book. Nowadays, the name of this quiet, quaint town is, perhaps somewhat improbably, best known through British Leyland, the once giant automobile company, which started off in Leyland in 1895, producing steam lawnmowers, but would grow to dominate the motor industry in the 20th century, giving rise to such iconic and world-famous cars as the Jaguar, the Land Rover and the Mini. Now, none of this is particularly relevant for the story, but I really do want a steam lawnmower, and I haven't even got a lawn. The history of the Church of St Andrews at Leyland goes back to 1220 in one form or another, and there was an even earlier building before it, with a commonly suggested date of 1050. It may be up to a thousand years old. The current building is a solid, stone-built structure, with stained glass windows and a tower at one end. A green copper roof makes it look deceptively modern. In many ways it's a rather typical parish church, of a kind which exists all over the British Isles, a place where there are many churches of great antiquity. But according to a legend about the construction of the original church, it wasn't meant to be in Leyland at all. The parish a millennia ago was a wooded, wild place broken up only by the occasional small cluster of houses or clearing for farmland. The inhabitants of the area, few but pious, decided to construct a church, an activity rather in vogue at the time. The priest had had his heart set upon the idea for some time, and when finally the funds were raised, he thanked God for his good fortune. An architect and team of labourers were recruited to begin construction at the chosen site of Whittle the Woods, and on one fine day, Ground was finally broken and work began. As was traditional, the first stone was laid with a great and solemn ceremony and blessed by the priest himself in the morning, and then the real construction began in earnest. That evening, as dusk fell and the workers retired for the night, our as yet unnamed priest surveyed the results of the day's labour and felt a deep satisfaction at what he saw. Materials for the task, the stones and the beams, had now been carefully gathered at the site, ready for incorporating into the building. The priest went to sleep happy and content as he could ever remember being, and awoke early next morning to watch the construction. Imagine his horror when he arrived at the site to find nothing at all. The blessed stone, gone. The marked outline of the church, disappeared, along with any marks that might show evidence of it having ever existed. The huge piles of stone that had been carried to the site by teams of people vanished. The priest rubbed his eyes, blinked, but nothing changed. At this point he would have taken himself for completely mad had not the labourers and some local people arrived. Father Ambrose, they cried out, for that was the priest's name. Where have the foundations gone? Where are the stones from the quarry? How could anyone steal these? It's stranger even than that, said another man. Look here, the grass has not been touched. There's cowslips and buttercups growing here that I dug up myself yesterday. On hearing this, the mood of the people changed from one of incredulity to a sort of fear. Father Ambrose gave word to it. There's something not right here, maybe even something evil about all of this. A worried muttering arose in the crowd, and Father Ambrose was at a loss what to do. Shortly, however, events took an even stranger turn. A runner arrived at the site, 
looking for Ambrose. Once he had regained his breath, the man related his message. Father, I have come this morning from Leyland, the town being about four miles away from Whistler Woods. The strangest thing has happened there. In a field owned by Adam the Miller, the foundations of a church have appeared overnight, along with all manner of building materials. There was a gasp from the crowd. Adam the Miller is saying that if this is anything to do with you, he'll have you for trespass. Because Adam apparently believed Ambrose might be in the habit of supernaturally sneaking up churches overnight. Always looking for someone to blame, Adam. So, the crowd set off for Leyland. But not before Father Ambrose got himself a hearty breakfast. Because he was a man truly committed to his daily routine. On arriving in Leyland, the crowd encountered another crowd. This second crowd were all milling about in the miller's field and gawking. The two crowds met, merged, and became one really big crowd, milling about. Adam strode right up to Father Ambrose and started making out with the accusations of field stealing via the unusual method of nocturnal church construction. This isn't me. My masons are all at Whitley Woods, ready to work. We'd have hardly been able to do this overnight, would we? Not after working yesterday and all. And with no sound? No. I suspect a higher power, good or evil, and I worry it may be the latter. Ambrose went to inspect the building in the miller's field, and indeed it was the exact same as the one put together the day before. Even the mortar was mixed, ready for the filling. This must be some scheme of the evil lord himself, though for what purpose I know not. But I will not be beaten by him. And so the priest instructed the men to take everything out of Adam's field and to cart the whole place back to its original site. This time they were accompanied by Adam and several of the Leyland crowd. By the end of the day, the bolstered team had succeeded in relaying the foundations and constructing a small amount of wall in addition. Father Ambrose was determined that there would be no repeat of the previous evening's events, and so selected two stout and brave fellows to guard the place overnight. The rest of the people were eager to retreat to their houses as darkness fell, concerned lest Ambrose's concerns be correct and Satan himself be about. The watchmen made themselves comfortable for the evening. Sacks on which to sit, a warm campfire, and food and ale. Ambrose did not stay himself, for he was an older man, and very tired after the excitement and exertion of the day. But he gave the men his blessing and some advice. After he had left, the men settled around the cheering fire for a hearty supper and a flagon of ale. And, well, do I need to go on? The results of leaving watchmen and beer together must be one of the oldest story tropes in existence, possibly predating the discovery of alcohol itself. First one man said to the other, Well, one can watch as well as two, so I may as well get me some sleep. If out happens, wake me. And no sooner had those words passed his lips than he had drifted off into peaceful dreams. The other man took a long swig from the bottle and gazed into the flames. Soon there were two sets of snores coming from around the little fire. The chirpings of the birds and the first shafts of sunlight woke the two. And would you believe it, but when they cast their eyes to the foundations of the church, if it wasn't there to be found at all, there was a half-confession. Whatever it was that could spirit away stone such, well, it must have put us to sleep against our will, father. That was their story, and they were sticking to it. Luckily for them, Father Ambrose was a kindly priest, and to save the two sleepy watchmen embarrassment, he accepted their explanation. He was doing so just as the runner arrived from Leyland again. This day went very much like the previous. Ambrose was not prepared to give in, and neither was the miller prepared to give up his field. And so, all the bits and bobs were once again carted back by locals and by masons who didn't really feel that this was quite what they'd signed up for. That evening, the watchman begged for another chance and swore off the drink, for a day at least. Ambrose stayed with them for a while as well, eating supper with them. The church foundations remained steadfastly where they had been dug, as was right and proper. However, about midnight, Ambrose eventually became tired and left the field for his nearby house, extracting promises from the men that they would stay behind, stay awake, and keep watch. 
It was about half an hour later that one of the men suddenly started. There, there, look! His voice trembled with fear. It appeared out of the darkness. A huge black shape, feet padding the ground. That's something terrible, whispered one man to the other. And indeed it was, for it was a cat. But a cat far larger than any the man had seen before, and with great unnatural looking eyes that seemed to burn as though alight. And its tail, swinging from side to side, had a huge evil looking barb on the end of it, more like a scorpion than a feline. The monstrous creature took no notice of its two human observers, but made for the piles of stone set aside for the construction of the church. With ease, it took up a large stone, and vanished with it. A moment later, it was back, sans stone, and it took another. Our brave watchmen stood transfixed with terror. But oh, the demands of masculinity are strong, for finding the cause was not enough. And though he was much afeared, the one who had fallen asleep second the night before steeled himself. I'll put a stop to this, lest that priest thinks that we fell asleep again. And so saying, he picked up a large piece of wood. With his companion close behind, he made his way down to the field where the diabolical beast continued its work, raking its paws across holes which filled themselves in again. It paid no heed to the two fellows creeping closer and closer, and soon the men were within striking distance. The one raised his makeshift cudgel high, and illuminated in the moonlight, he brought it down on the cat's head. A terrible scream pierced the silence of the night. Not one of pain, just of anger. In an instant, the animal turned and leapt, flinging down the poor man to the ground. And there was a second scream, which was cut off prematurely when the jaws of the beast closed around the watchman's neck. The other man was already running, running to where he probably should have gone first, to the priest and to the others of the village. With great speed, a mob was quickly assembled, and they rushed back to the site of the church. There was no cat there, Neither was there any sign that the ground had been troubled by the construction of a building. But what there was, was a body. Eyes glazed over, gazing unseeingly at the stars, its throat torn out. The power of the fiend was now in no doubt, and the people arrived at a decision. It would not do to try the will of such a monster a third time. And so the miller relented and the church was constructed in his field, where it stands to this day. And, perhaps in somewhat poor taste, there is in the church a statue of the great cat, to convince those sceptical about the story. So, some variant of this story, where a church is being constructed and the stones are moved to another place, is very widespread, and attached to a large number of churches in England and Wales. Often, but not in this case, these are churches built at the top of hills, and the story is used to explain why they weren't built in more convenient and accessible locations. Sometimes the movers of the stones are the fairies protecting their area. Sometimes it's the devil himself, and at others, quite conversely, it's the work of divine power, moving the church to a more blessed spot. Which kind of makes a lot more sense to me. It's a common folk motif or meme that attaches itself to lots of places in oral tradition, probably with lots of variation in the telling, until some folklorist comes and writes down a version that becomes more widely known. The Leyland story is the only variant I've found of a giant cat as the culprit, an animal not really best suited to lifting and carrying, though I think we can assume that this is some form of evil spirit, or perhaps even the devil himself. What I find quite odd about these kind of stories and this is a fine example, is that the people seem to just be beaten by the quite clearly malevolent evil spirit. Compared to many other tropes about the spread of Christianity, where saints and priests basically use their god to beat the crap out of other gods, this seems like quite a strange and moral story. This evil spirit told us where we had to build our church and tried to stop us building it where we wanted, 
We came up with absolutely no plan to stop this. God did not step in to help. And in the end, we just sort of gave up and built the church exactly where the evil spirit wanted. And then presumably went and prayed there to God. Which, it really just sounds like the kind of scenario which would result in a very cursed church and a very angry deity. Given this, I'm not entirely surprised to find that when researching this, the church's website fails to make reference to the rather inauspicious circumstance of its founding, and focuses more on Christianity and Jesus. Though it definitely could have been worse. There are a number of versions of the story which have the moving of the stones being carried out by a particularly dexterous pig. If you were casually passing by the large body of water that is Lady Bower Reservoir, you wouldn't notice Derwin Church. Even if you went looking for it, you'd be hard-pressed to find it today, because the village of Derwent and its church are in fact no more, for the reservoir covers the site of the old village. For a few years after the area was flooded and the village sunk, the spire of the church could be seen above the waterline, an eerie view through the morning mist. Eventually, this too was demolished, falling into the water, and nothing was left of the former village of Derwent. And if you pay heed to a story about the church, that may not be an entirely bad thing. The new reverend, Mr Goodwin, was a young and fine man, recently out of college and training. He was full of energy and ready to make a difference in the world. He was inspired to tend to his flock, to help people, to teach them the right and wrong ways of life, brimming over with confidence and a desire to bring the benefits of the most modern ecclesiastical education to people who had not had the advantage to receive it that he had. It was with some joy in his heart that he arrived at his new parish. The village of Derwent Woodland was far away from the city that had been his home, but there was something truly stunning about this part of the country. The sky was blue and the sun shone on the green hills, the tranquil forests, the gentle streams running through them. A simpler place, far away from the dirt and squalor of modern urban life. The man he was replacing had been there for many years, and he had been warned by many of his colleagues that it would be hard for an outsider to find acceptance, that he would have to be patient. But his first few months in the parish proved very much to the contrary. Though they had clearly loved the priest before him, a man now sadly deceased, he found them more than accepting of himself. They listened with interest at his sermons, they helped him get acquainted with the local area, and they even began coming to him for advice over certain issues. He had found the church building a mess at first, but with the help of the church wardens, he replaced the furniture and began to bring the building into a fit state of habitation. Soon he was preaching regularly to his enthusiastic congregation, It was all going better than he had dared to expect. After he had been there some four months, he was officiating over his first busy Christmas period, and it had been a particularly successful, if tiring time, filled with constant frenetic activity. It was as the year was coming to the close that he received an unusual request from one of the church wardens. Mr Wheatcroft was his name. Reverend, you will be preaching the service on the last Sunday of the year, won't you? The one at midnight? the one for the souls of those who will depart. Mr Goodwin was quite taken aback. While sermons of remembrance might take place in Catholic churches, there was no such equivalent in the Church of England. He carefully explained the theological point, detailing how he could not do such a thing, for the scandal it would bring down. The bishop would be shocked, the people would be shocked. But he was interrupted. No, no, your reverence, for this is a request from all the peoples of this parish. It has always been done. It always must be done. They were stood in the church as they had this conversation, which Goodwin was beginning to become a little worried was bordering on the heretical. The second church warden spoke up now and pointed upwards. They'll be in the gallery. The gallery, man? It's not fit for use by any person. It's on my list to fix up, but I've hardly done it yet. We couldn't use that this weekend, even if I were to preach here. Which I'm not. But it'll just be the souls, won't it? Just the souls? What are you talking about, man? The souls of them to die next year. 
Those are the ones who creep up there on Sunday for the Mass. You've got to preach. What would happen if they were to miss out? At that moment, a good many choice words that a churchman was not permitted to utter flashed through Goodwin's mind. Eventually he settled on, What absolute tommy rot! And he intended to leave the matter at that. But throughout the days leading up to the fated Sunday, he noticed a change in his congregation. They seemed less friendly than previous. Nothing outright rude, just a little less warm. The church warden spoke to him again on the Sunday, insisting that he give the sermon at midnight. Eventually he relented, but only in order that if he was known to have gone to the church at midnight, he would then be able to double down in his warnings of the folly of superstition and non-doctrinal belief. When he relented, the church wardens greatly relaxed, and the Sunday was a much more pleasant day for Goodwin. And though he was still angry, he was pleased that he had managed to resolve the situation in a method by which it could become a lesson. Being midwinter, the sun set early, and so there were many hours of darkness. By candlelight, Goodwin studied and worked on his sermon on superstition. In the still and dark of the night, a lesser man might have started to become a tiny bit nervous. But not so Goodwin. He was looking forward to teaching these people the error of their ways. The older of the church wardens arrived at the gates to the churchyard a little before midnight. Just to check, the reverend was on his way. Goodwin was a man who prided himself on his word, and despite his scepticism, he was prepared as promised. He bid the church wardens farewell and told them he discussed the thing in the morning before he took the short walk to his unlit church, lantern in hand. He produced his big set of iron keys and with a certain amount of noise unlocked the door, just as usual, and pushed it open. The lantern illuminated a small puddle of light in the darkness and Goodwin strode down the central aisle to the pulpit as he did for every sermon. His footsteps echoed in the empty darkness. He reached the lectern, placed his Bible upon it, and as expected, he raised his eyes to an empty church. The pews were uninhabited. The place was completely silent. And then a flicker caused him to raise his eyes slightly. To the gallery. Off limits, dangerous. Goodwin gasped and started. There were human figures in the gallery. They regarded him silently. He could make out faces despite the darkness. They were people he knew from the village. Now he was just angry. This was some kind of silly wind-up. He raised his voice to deliver a stinging rebuke, but his words died in his throat when his eyes alighted upon one particular figure with a very distinctive visage. One that he saw every morning in his shaving mirror. Goodwin showed remarkable strength of spirit and, as promised, he delivered a sermon. Not the one he was preparing beforehand, but earnest words quietly spoken to the listeners. Those who would die in that year. It was the best sermon he ever gave. And indeed, on the day the last of that winter's snow melted from the church roof, the Reverend Goodwin lay at rest in the church graveyard. So in this story, there may not be very many surprises or narrative twists. Basically, a reverend is told to go and preach a sermon at midnight for all those who will die in the year. He goes and preaches the service, and all those who will die in the year turn up. Simple. But it is interesting and kind of different. Like the previous tale, it's been told about many different churches, though in recent times it has particularly attached itself to the sunken church at Derwent Woodland, perhaps because that gives a good reason that the annual tradition has now been brought to a definite close, without slandering the name of any existing church that may, for very good reason, wish to disassociate itself from such a story. For our final tale, we don't go too far from Derwent, 
but we do turn to a building which very much still exists today and is far, far grander than the sunken church ever was. You may not have heard of Lincoln Cathedral, but according to various sources, from 1311 it was the tallest building in the world, taking over the title from the Great Pyramid, and it remained the tallest building in the world for 238 years. So really, you probably should have heard of it. Within Lincoln Cathedral is the Shrine of St Hugh, who, like many saints, is the patron of a variety of miscellanea. In his case, it's the sick, shoemakers and swans. Clearly they'd reached S in the alphabet when they were giving out patronages. The cathedral is a huge, fascinating building with a rich history that could be the topic of a podcast or several itself. It has a great wealth of stonework, including images of adulterers having their genitals bitten off by dragons in hell. But the most famous of all the statues... Well, there's a story behind that. Normally, the devil was a pretty awful employer. He was forever neglecting his health and safety executive requirements. He was frequently absent for long periods of time, having been trapped by a mortar in a shoe or something like that. And yet he demanded literal blood, sweat and tears from his employees. Sure, the job might be fun at times, but the boss was just lousy. But not today. Today the devil was in an unaccountably good mood. Perhaps he'd got some great ideas reading the latest Hieronymus Bosch triptych. Maybe he'd become aware that hell was better stock than heaven to become the marshmallow toasting capital of the theological universe. Perhaps he got a knockdown job lot rate on a load of souls. Honestly, it's never explained. But he was humming one of those great tunes he'd got and looking positively jolly. He rounded a corner to find a bunch of imps. They all began the usual cower in his presence routine, but he waved it off. No need, guys, no need. Hey, it's a lovely day. And you guys haven't had a break in. Ooh, must be a millennia, right? Ten, actually, piped at one brave and stupid imp. Ten, yeah, yeah, whatever. Well, tell you what, why don't you guys take the rest of the day off? Go down to Earth, or up to Earth, or something. Just chill. The imps looked at each other nervously. This had to be a trap. Go, shoo, enjoy, that's an order, said Satan himself. And somewhat reassured, though somewhat still expecting the other cloven hoof to fall, they headed off for Earth. Like a bunch of 17 to 18 year olds on their first trip to Ibiza, they didn't really know what to do with their newfound freedom, but they started to experiment. This had varying results. One of the imps went riding rainbows, another burrowed into the earth, while yet another grappled with lightning. But one imp, perhaps more experienced, perhaps just more reckless, made his way onto the wind, and was blown all the way to the city of Lincoln, and to the great cathedral at the heart of it. Oh, what fun, said the imp. We can take the wind inside the church and blow around all the canons and priests with a great rush. We can smash the windows, put out the candles, cause havoc and destruction of all kinds. And he rubbed his clawed hands together in impish glee. But when the imp tried to enact its plan, it found the wind would not go with it. The imp tried cajoling it, threatening it, pleading with it, giving it a push with its horned head to encourage it but the howling element just simply wouldn't budge. Too holy a wind was it to be involved in such diabolical mischief. The frustrated imp finally admitted defeat. Fine, I don't need you anyway. I'll do it without you. I was only trying to show you how to have a bit of fun. But wind, you must wait here until I return. And into the great cathedral flew the imp, all are ready to wreak mayhem. And so it did stripping tapestries from the walls, throwing all the pews into a state of great disarray, blowing out the candles, spilling their wax on the floor. An impolite, impious and impertinent creature it most certainly was. The imp chortled and giggled, and generally had a great time admiring the destruction it had wrought, and it rested against a wall as it surveyed the results of its improper deeds. But a cathedral is a sacred place, And as the devil has those in his service, so too does the Lord. And from a book of prayers there emerged an angel, a beautiful creature with golden hair and amethyst eyes. 
The angel looked around in terrible shock. The imp on the wall looked down with a sneer, crossed one leg over the other as it rested, and jeered and mocked the horrified servant of God. But the angel had a fitting riposte for the imp. O awful creature, said he, raising into the air, O impudent creature, there you rest, and there you shall remain. And in an instant, the imp was quite literally petrified, that is, turned into stone. And there he remains to this day, grin on his face, one leg crossed over another. And outside the cathedral, the wind still waits for his return. So, the legend of the so-called Lincoln Imp is a fascinating one for a number of reasons. Firstly, the Imp has managed to achieve a status somewhat akin to town mascot within modern-day Lincoln. Its resemblance to a tiny devil might be considered off-putting to some, but in Lincoln it's pretty much a local hero. It appears as the logo of the Lincolnshire County Council, as Banch of Lincoln City Football Club, who are nicknamed the Imps, as well as on various local businesses, and you can of course buy Imp-related merchandise in a large variety of forms. The actual imp in the church is a grotesque. That's the technical name for a statue or stone carving of an odd creature. They are what I often think of as gargles, although a gargle should actually technically gargle, that is, spurt water. Grotesques like this aren't exactly uncommon. Indeed, there is another similar imp on the outside of the cathedral. Various forms, even of this particular cross-legged devil-like imp, exist in churches across the UK dating to the medieval period. There is a great deal of speculation that such images are representations of pagan deities remembered in folk culture after the coming of Christianity. And indeed it is true that the site of some UK churches have been places of worship since pre-Christian times. However, hard evidence for this alluring proposition is, unfortunately, somewhat thin on the ground. The story of this particular imp has origins that are equally shrouded in mystery. There are a large number of different versions of the story. Some have two imps. Some have the imp not turned to stone, but just unwilling to leave. Some have the bishop turning the imp to stone. Quite a lot also include bits with other churches, particularly one in Grimsby, which are used to explain similar statues there. Not one of these stories, including the version I've just told you, is particularly considered definitive. They're all stories just told about the imp. It's oft quoted that the story dates to the 14th century, but I can't really find any hard evidence to back that up. Well, I'm happy to be proved wrong if you know of any. And in fact, the origin of the imp story seemed more rooted in the 19th century, and it seems the legend owes almost as much to marketing as it does to the imp and the cathedral. For in the late 19th century, James Usher, a jeweller and watchmaker in Lincoln, gained the right to use the image of the imp. Some people, who may or may not have been connected to Usher, wrote letters to newspapers suggesting that possessing a representation of the imp was a charm for good luck. And soon, Usher was making quite an impression with his imp jewellery, and it appeared on some fairly influential, ugh, sorry about that one, people. And it is around this time when the versions of the imp legend seem to become popular. The story owes its origins in no small part to entrepreneurship and highly effective 19th century guerrilla marketing. So there we go. Three short little snippets of folklore about churches. There are a great many more stories I could have told, many of which are repeated across the UK but with the location changed, and some more truly local legends focused on the particulars of a certain building. For the past one and a half millennia, the impact of Christianity and the church on Britain have been enormous, and the influence this has had on folk tales and legends of these isles is difficult to overemphasise. Quite apart from the biblical myths and legends themselves, the place of the church building in the minds of the population over that time would be incredibly significant. Even today, in an increasingly secular country where only 5% of the population regularly attends church, there are approximately 50,000 churches, or one for every 1,300 people. In the 18th century, this might have been as high as one church for every 500 people, and for hundreds of years, church attendance was technically compulsory. In any case, the local church would have loomed large in life. Quite likely it was the grandest building that most people would ever enter, and it was at the very centre of the community. The greatest events of life were all played out there. Christenings, marriages, funerals, 
but in earlier times, churches were often used for a variety of events that today we might think of as secular. Marketplaces might be hosted within cathedral halls, the local church would dispense justice through its courts, and the church sometimes even hosted raucous festivals where the famous parish ale was served. So the church was smack bang at the centre of most people's lives for centuries. So it's no real surprise that there's such a wealth of traditional stories. And, hey, we haven't even started on the graveyards. Stories like these of churches with a supernatural bent that are not exactly mainstream Christian, but which, by placing their events locally, tie the everyday to the idea of an invisible world of good and evil, be it divine, diabolic or angelical, about which Christianity was also preaching. And finally, I can't leave you without just one more very short little tale. The Church of St Mary and All Saints in Chesterfield, North Derbyshire, has a particularly notable feature. It's referred to as the Crooked Spire, but this word doesn't really do justice to the way the whole spire is twisted around. Visible from miles around, it's a very improbable shape, and you expect it to fall down any minute. I'll put a picture of it up on the podcast blog so you can see for yourself. There are a number of fascinating local stories telling how the spire became so misshapen. And there's also a boring and supposedly real explanation you can find on Wikipedia. But the story I most enjoy is the one that holds the church had a perfectly normal spire. Until one day, an actual virgin was married in the church. And the building was so shocked, it turned round to look at the bride. The legend has it that should another virgin ever be married there, it'll turn around again. But it's been several hundred years, and the prospects at the moment seem somewhat dim. That's it for this week. Thanks for listening to this slightly different format episode. Let us know what you think, and if you want to help out the podcast, then please give it a review on iTunes, or just let your friends know about it. Next week, we'll return to telling just the one tale. We'll be going back to medieval sources and their account of the very founding of Britain, which has more strong, independent-minded women, murder, and diabolical incest than one might have hitherto. You can follow Tales of Britain and Ireland podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. There's also a website, talesofbritainandireland.com, where there's a page for each episode which contains more information, including illustrations, asides, and recaps along with other additional bits and pieces to explore. The intro music was written and performed by Alice Nichols, and you can find all the other musical credits on the episode page on the website. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please do share it with others or give it a review, as those really are the best ways to help us out. You can also join Tales of Britain and Ireland on Patreon to get extra members' episodes. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join me again soon.